And here we are, friends. Welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, where currently you are hearing from me, Jason, and we also have Travis. Hello, hello. And we've got Dave here, our guest for the day. Hello, thank you. Here to talk about some narrative events and narrative in general for Kill Team, something we haven't really touched on, right, Jason? That's true. Um, and Dave made a super cool app called Teammate, which we'll also make sure to link in the episode description as well. Teammate.software. Yeah. I have a couple players using it locally for our current narrative campaign, and the people who have iPhones love it. And all the people with Android <laughs> are jealous because they have a Google Sheet. I know. I'm sorry. I just, uh, I'm only one man. I only know one software stack. I've got an iPhone, so I'm excited about it. Have you seen this app at all, at, uh, Jason? Um, yeah, I, I downloaded it just like a couple days ago, and I've kind of been just like poking around and looking at it, and uh, it's super cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess I can go. Uh, so the idea was, well, so Teammate, again, teammate.software, um, if you want to look at it, it's for iPhone, iPad, and Mac. Um, and first, it's a, a, a roster builder designed just for Kill Team. So you can go in, if you go into a tournament, make your roster. Um, it knows all of the different operatives and what they're allowed to take. So it's not going to let you take like a plasma pistol and a power sword on your space marine sergeant um, because it knows, you know, the correct, uh, the correct loadouts. Um, and then I had heard from tournament organizers that often they'll get rosters turned in where people are forgetting to put like chapter tactics or boons of Zinch and stuff. So um, it will make sure that you've picked a chapter tactic for Marines, um, Marks of Chaos for Legionaries, and it doesn't let you do like Corn Balefire Acolytes because that's not allowed. Um, for Higher Tech Circle and um, Work Coven, it will put up a little icon to remind you to go in there and pick their powers and boons and stuff so that uh, you're creating a, a proper roster. And then you can click the share button and copy and paste that into BCP or print it or email it to a PO as needed. But then the other part of it was having done narrative, and I think we can talk about this. Um, one of the things I definitely found in, in 40K and in Kill Team was the load of all the bookkeeping required to track. If you're if you're keeping track of experience, um, how much kind of menial effort is required to track experience points, um, keep track of who has a, a, a scar or an honor or an upgrade and all of that stuff. And um, so I, I wanted to make a, a software tool that could handle all of that for you. So in teammate, if you, when you, when you create your roster, if you pick a spec ops roster, um, it will track all that. Uh, it, it'll keep track of what your team has, what upgrades they're allowed to take um, um, for, for uh, strategic assets and, and equipment and rare equipment. And then when you go to play a game, you can click start game, pick your roster, pick your tack ops, pick your mission and all of that. And it will give you buttons to track when you get incapacitated and operative, when you do a mission action, when you're incapacitated, when you score attack up, and it'll track all that EXP for you. Um, and like one of the things I, I had kind of glossed over when I read the rules the first few times is like you're only allowed to get one experience point for every kill or, or, or per operative, they get one EXP if they get a kill in a game. Um, and if you didn't notice that and you were giving yourself too much EXP, you know, I mean, that maybe that's okay. You know, no one cares if you're doing it wrong as long as you and your friends do it consistently. But this way, the tool will correctly guide you toward the right uh, progression. Um, and so if you mark when someone gets killed, then at the end of the match, it'll tell you to uh, run a, a casualty test for everybody. Um, it'll it'll do the, generate the battle scars. It'll level people up and let you pick the, the honors. Um, so the, really the goal was um, to automate as much of that for you so that you can focus on actually playing the game and um, learn, using the operatives instead of having to like keep track of all that stuff by hand. Yeah, the fun parts of narrative, not the... <laughs> right. I know locally when I tried playing narrative, we did a three-month narrative campaign a couple months or like last year. And I, because we were only playing games once every two weeks, I basically just forgot my rules every two weeks. So I'd just be yeah. like looking at my roster every time I, we sat down to play. I'm like, I don't remember which of these guys has which of these rules. And I honestly, every two weeks is just too much. And there's just a lot of a lot of small bookkeeping things. So it sounds like the app is a great help for that. So I'm really looking forward to my players giving us feedback. So hopefully you're going to get some feedback over our 
one year long narrative campaign that we're doing. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think there's, I kind of think of narrative as there's sort of three parts to narrative. The first is like the missions, which I think Kill Team does a good job with, right? You, you, you buy the box and it has the book and it has all the terrain you need. And it gives you these neat missions at the end of the book that, uh, you know, some of them are kind of wacky or don't really work. But uh, I think it's fun to play through them, some of those because they're some of them are really cool, you know. And it gives you like a little a little one mission story that you can play. And then the second part is the campaign, which would be playing multiple games that tell some sort of story. You know, you're on a planet that's being invaded by orcs and you need to rescue a VIP, you know, whatever your story is that you're telling. And that's, I think, something that GW doesn't. Uh, provide much. Winter's SEO has talked about this in his uh, Warhammer 40k channel that like they should be releasing books every couple months that have like here's a campaign set on this planet or here's a here's a set of missions you can go through. The the Arcs of Omen book has uh, some of that but um, I think that that's something that's really missing and I think you can do that without kind of the third part which is progression you know experience leveling up. People kind of seem to want the I like the idea that as you play games, your your operatives are going to level up and, and get new powers. But I do find, like, I'm even having done all this work on it, I'm sort of, like, go back and forth on, like, is it, does the game need more rules, right? Like, that's what that's what you wind up adding is it's like, oh, now this guy has yeah, you're, you're really rules this. And... Adding on a lot of extra rules, a lot of extra memorization, like, even setup takes longer with narrative because then you have to count up how many like what the difference in um operative power is so that you can figure out who gets you know some extra extra power ups you, you can't although if you use teammate it'll automate that for you I'll see. um but uh yeah it, it is and, and and i don't know like i as much as i like narrative and obviously um i do sometimes wonder like is it, it there might just be value in and and i think you could totally run an event where you're just telling the story and people are, are, you know, playing their games without all the upgrades, or you could do, it, there might be a lot of value in doing a limited progression where you just hand out like rare equipment for winning games, but don't level up the operatives themselves, you know, something like that. Well, like the equipment, rare equipment is an interesting one because you are paying for it with uh, EPs. So you could give somebody like an architect grenade as a reward for, you know, rescuing the hostage or, or whatever you're, you know, um, or, or you know, securing the arc, you know, whatever, whatever it is. But they would still have to pay four EPs for it instead of three for a crack grenade. So that would kind of balance it, you know, in, in some other way. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah, like one uh, thing that we've ta- talked about a few times in my local scene is just doing like single day narrative campaigns. And I know like there's some narrative campaigns out there. Like um, a- at least one of my friends went to the KTO narrative thing and mentioned that like people were using the the teammate app there and uh but just like generally like the kto narrative thing is like a cool example of i mean i didn't do it myself uh was it was it everything that you hoped it would be it was it was really fun ben ben from um battle brothers tabletop ran it um and he did do the full spec ops package with gaining experience and everything it does get overwhelming especially in a short session because you're you've just played two games in a row and you're starting your third game and you have to remember that now, you know, this, this guy gives a balanced aura and this one, um, you know, re-roll, you know, whatever it is. Um, but he also did an accelerated um, experience curve where people were leveling up faster than they would normally, um, which is cool because by the end, like you're, my my leader was like a revered status and she was like, my Lucia Vane was just like a, a monster because she was like, just had you know three or four upgrades it was it was cool um but the event itself i think almost didn't need that like it was just fun by itself he'd written this story where like we were in a space hulk that was falling into the warp and so um he had rules for npc pox walkers he had like several hundred little uh 3d printed like little zombie dudes that would spawn at the beginning of each turn and they would randomly or they would move toward you and then they would charge you if you got in range of them so we were playing against each other to, to complete the mission, but then also having to do with pox walkers. So in, I had like a game I was playing against this one, one guy who was playing Marines and, and um, he had picked central control um, for, for one of his, his secondaries. And the center of that map was in this hallway uh, and into the dark. And there was a pox walker spot on either point of it. And I was like, Oh, 
well, that's lucky because he's never going to be able to score that because he's going to have like six pock walkers around all the time. And then he sent his space Marine sergeant in who had like a power fist and a, and a, a hand flamer. And he just like flamed them all and punched his way into the middle and scored both his points. It was like this really epic, uh, 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 it was really, I was like, Oh, that was badass. Like I was really happy for, you know, um, and, and then he just stood in the middle and like Pox walkers would spot and he would just hand flame them and punch them out. It was neat. Um, and then the, uh, the, the fourth or fifth game I played, I think it was the fifth game. Fourth game was against, uh, uh, Mark Leander and uh, Liam's dad. Uh, fifth game was against um, this guy uh, who um, was play. I was playing Star Striders and he was playing Vet Guard. And the fir- which the hard can be hard because I've got lots of uh, lots of lethal five blast assets. And so I opened the door and dropped the cluster bomb on like half his poor team. Um, and then we decided that. Um, we, you know, we had Poxwalker spawning all over the place around us, and we decided that maybe my uh, armsman had just, my voidsman had just gotten an issue trigger finger, and um, that d- hadn't realized that the uh, that guard on the other side were were the, you know the good guys in their perspective. So we decided to call a truce, and we put our backs to each other and just fought off the Poxwalkers and uh, didn't attack each other. Like dark time, so that was kind huh? of a neat neat event we did, and then but the fun part was he had painted his up as like an inquisitorial retinue. So his veteran sergeant was painted like an inquisitor and I had taken reputation to maintain the, the star strider, um, pack up where you have to out, out damage your opponent. And so we kept this running tally as we were like mowing down zombies of like who, you know, what was my heirloom auto pistol and uh cane rapier doing more damage than his plasma pistol in power sword. And it was not. So, uh, he was able to outscore me on, uh, on damage done to zombies sounds very cool yeah that is cool and have you had a chance to run much narrative in your local scene we've done some um <clears throat> so i'm in the gamer the group i'm in is called victory gamers um we're in, in nominally out of false church virginia we play often at a, a bar called the boardroom in uh, arlington virginia um, we've got a big group um where some of the people are are part of the nova open team um and uh, we did one at uh, Halloween time that was like a, a, a pirate themed um, uh, heist into a Space Hulk. Um, that was like a one day event. Um, and then I've got one that I'm writing right now um, that I'm going to be starting probably later in the spring. Um, and I'm going to put it online. So look out on the probably the Kill Team Reddit and, and, and elsewhere. Um, the story, it, it's going to be a series of missions that probably the idea will be I'll release a new one every couple of weeks. Um, so you can kind of play along as we go or bundle a few and do them like in a one day event. Um, but the story is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. It's, um, something I like about the 40 K universe is how silly and exaggerated it can be. Cause if you think about like, uh, like a strike cruiser of space Marines that might have like, you know, 200 space Marines on it. Well, they're going to be backed by probably several thousand human assistants and serfs and probably going to be with, you know, a, a huge group of, of guardsmen or, or Navy or, you know, so, so it, one group of space Marines probably will have hundreds of thousands of people. And you think about like who's supplying, you know, so, so what I like to think is that like, in order to supply ships that are that large, you're, you're not just going to have a planet, that's like, they're not just going to be like running one farm, you know, and having like a, a, a planet that's producing, like not just a planet producing its entire output just to feed this one group of space Marines, but a whole planet that's just making like the taco shells for this one space, Marine, you know, and another whole planet that's just making like all of the wine and all the grapes, you know, and, and so like the scale is just absurd. So the setting for this event is going to be a planet um that is run by the the sisters uh hospitaler order the order hospitaler hospitaler um and this is a a planet penitentiary where they send all of their prisoners and if they recover they're sent over to the factories to get turned into servitors or um archoflagellants um and if they don't recover they're sent over to the uh artisan hive commune where they uh their main export are decorative skulls and this is where all of the, you know, if, you, if you're a, a space Marine and on the, on the hilt of your sword, you've got a nice pretty skull or you need to pose on, on your, you know, put your leg up on a skull to look nice. This is where all the skulls come from. 
Um, so that's going to be the setting for this planet that's being invaded by uh, uh, by, the by chaos. Of 40k really front and center on your narrative campaign, right? That's that, that's the idea. Um, yeah. And so yeah, I'm going to have a series of a series having, of missions having, where you, having like a vibe set up for it. your campaigns is always really good because it lets players kind of find their their reasons to like hook in. Yeah, that's the hope. Um, so th the idea will be I want the story to progress. So I'm going to have um, as one side or another takes kind of control of each sector um, that will affect in subsequent games who's attacker and defender and, and what the objectives are in the mission. So it could be fun. Um, I don't have it. Like I, I've started to write it. I've never written the background, obviously, but like deciding. And, and I'm probably just going to use missions from the books or adaptations from them um, so that it's easy to kind of, uh, you know, e either just tell you to play a mission, you know, this particular mission for this phase or or adapt it um, using, because I think it's easier to just be able to use the terrain that people already have. I think one of the things that definitely helped us kind of create a fun narrative experience was we used the terrain we already had. And instead of depending on the book missions, because some of the book missions are a little bit unbalanced to play, which can be a little yeah, 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 they are. <laughs> um, we put in like a twist that just happened for like that play period. So I think for one part of my campaigns, we were on a train going from one layer of a hive city to another so everything was like moving around and like being pushed around so all the non-heavy terrain shifted d3 mm -hmm. inches every turn so people would like set up for charges and then like all the terrain would like slam in front of them and just block their charges because they were on a rickety train oh man i love that so it's like a good way to like you have the narrative backdrop but you don't have to have specific terrain because a lot of the book terrain requires their terrain which can be a little rough for like Octarius. I mean, Octarius is probably easy, but for like Nachmund or Morok or some of those other ones, they do need those specific kind of like pieces to make it easy to set up. That's yeah, and it depends on some of the missions. I, I, I've heard definitely grumbling are, are kind of, I don't know the right word, but uh, competitive players, you know, want a balanced symmetrical board, you know, and, and, and I kind of, I mean, that's, I, I like that, but it's also fun to have these kind of weird, unbalanced missions where, uh, like, like what we one of the ones we did um, was we had uh, this this setting where the the players were trying to un the, 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 there's three games in one day, in the first two games there was one board where there was like a uh, a field that the the mission objective had you rolling dice to try to disable this field to get into the next part of, into the next room. And then I, I revealed at the end of that game that behind that field, uh, you know, you thought there was going to be treasure, but it was you're actually waking up a, a ship of Necrons. And so I took the top half of the, yeah. So I took the top half of the play, the players from the first two games, and they were the uh, on in one cohort. And then the bottom half, I gave them all a tray of Necrons to play with. This was pre higher tech circle. And the idea was the Necrons killed their teams, and I gave them a new team. And then we did the mission that's in the annual. That's the um, the endless one, the one where you're uh, like the, the horde. The, the one team, right? yeah, the one team respawns like if you get kills. And so it was just like the, the idea was everybody dies. You know, like e either your team has already been killed by the Necrons, or you just have to hold on as long as you can. Um, and so that was that was kind of fun slash meme because those people had to play as Necrons as, as terrible compendium Necrons. Um, it, it was funny. And there's one guy who was playing um, Adam, who's playing Corsairs, who did figure out how to stalemate it because they they couldn't Necrons couldn't move toward him as fast as he could shoot them down, and so it just they went like 13 turning points and they gave up because neither of them could <laughs> make any progress. Very cool, very cool. I think one of our narrative hooks was a chaos. We put them in a chaos field, like a warp field, and they had to jump from terrain to terrain because the floor was lava. Um, and they were praying to the different chaos gods to bring them back to real space. And then upon getting back to real space, there was a demon that got buffs based on how many gods they prayed to collectively. So if they prayed to Korn, the monster had like, I think, plus one crit damage and an extra attack for every time they prayed to Korn. And for Slanesh, it moved faster and it just like ran around and murdered a bunch of stuff. So that was one of our like one day narrative campaigns. I definitely found with, with those sorts of events that like we did try having people do spec ops and it just wound up not being, you know, I, I feel like spec ops really are much more suited to you and three friends are playing um, over, you know, once a week over a, a you know, period where yeah. it was just doing, doing the bookkeeping. And this is before I made the app, but even with the app, 
Um, like, I don't know how much you wind up, you don't gain a lot of experience over a short number of games. And no. I think it's more fun to just write, write a goofy story and have everyone kind of play in it. Um, yeah. I, I'm curious to see if they I, change it. I've had some good success today and... locally for a, like one day narratives, just giving everybody two level ups per game. And then at the end of <clears> it, you get one guy kind of at the third rank and then three dudes <clears> kind of floating around at different ranks. And I found that to be pretty nice because you get... You get a little bit of everything, and then I've always given, or I started giving people battle scars every round. So, like, if a guy goes incapacitated, he gets an injury because it's just more fun to have that story going. It is. I like. I like that idea. That like, oh, this guy's got a bad leg, and you know, he's uh, hobbling around a little bit. You know, whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We've got a narrative campaign thing that's been going on over here for a little while. Um, I'm actually not the one running it. Someone else stepped up to uh, get that all coordinated. But I've also been pretty involved in like making some homebrew rules for it. So one of the things that we did for a homebrew for our narrative campaign that we've had going on over here in Minnesota is the amount of victory points that you earn is directly equal to the amount of experience you gain for that. And then just at the end of the game, you just like pass it out and you could be like, you know what? I got, I got like 12 victory points. Um, I don't remember if we had something like there's a cap of, you can only earn one battle honor per model per game or something like that. But it's basically just like, I got 12 victory points. So these two guys are going to get a, their first battle honor. So it kind of shakes out and to I be did... similar to what Travis was saying of like, you get two battle honors and then you do the next thing. Um, but yeah, and it's been fun. That's People something I tried. It. I tried for in teammate too, was like, it's never going to prevent you from like, like you can always just go in and tap somebody's experience up. Um, like it'll, if you play a game, it'll give you the kind of, you know, supposedly correct, uh, experience value. Although I did have an, op I do have a custom option there where you can have a double your EXP for each thing, but you can always just go into the app, um, and just click someone's experience up to level them up or, or give yourself more, uh, requisitions or equipment because like ultimately the app is in, in, in charge of you, you know, it's just a, it's a digital notepad. Um, I have found a couple things. I feel strongly that you should roll for battle honors and not pick them. I just think that's more fun um, to kind of add a little bit of wackiness in there where you're going to get, I mean, if it's, if you wind up with something that's totally inappropriate for your operative, um, I will re-roll it. But I think it, I found it to be much more fun to randomize uh, upgrades where possible. Um, and then also I know the guy who runs the local, the 40K crusade um, has everyone reset periodically because it's also just not, it, it does get to a point where you're so overpowered um, that it just, you know, becomes absurd. So I think having that reset uh, at either a natural story point or, point or um, you know, kind of on a, a quarterly or, or every year or whatever um, is, is a useful house rule to do. Yeah. yeah I've, I, go, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I've done, so I mean, like, uh, I've done a lot of, way more than, you know, I should for uh, just, like, homebrew narrative rules. And it's it's not entirely just, like, uh, the campaign story stuff, but, like, mechanics. And uh, one of the things that I always thought was interesting, and this one I've really only, like, mentioned to a couple people, and uh, we haven't, like, tried it, but, like, um, having having the balance in a in a campaign be a little more, like... You know, based on the grim dark mechanic of like, if this guy dies, he's dead forever. So it's hard to maintain operatives that have a bunch of battle honors and stuff like that. And then like mm -hmm. that keeps it naturally balanced. And then like if you have someone that is like super stacked, you don't want to just do something willy nilly because you don't want to lose them. Yeah, kill team. It's a little bit hard to permit. I've had people permit die, but it's not. You have you have to roll two ones, and I kind of think there's a house rule that isn't in there that should be. Which is that there's a requisition called recuperate where you can, or it might be medevac, um, where you can, if somebody gets a battle scar, you can cancel it, but they have to skip the next game. And I sort of think that that should not be usable on slain results. Like if somebody dies, I think they should just be dead because I think it does require you to keep your list a little more fresh. And, and um, yeah. I, I think, think it's just more fun to have that. I've had a player locally, I think we started a narrative campaign and I believe he's playing legionaries or chaos space marines at the time. And I believe three of his operatives died in the first two games. 
So he basically just had to restart his roster. Yeah, I let right. him write in a piece of lore about how one surviving guy collected a bunch of cultists and restarted. And then in the next <laughs> game, his leader died again. And we're like, I just don't, I just don't know what to say. Like, if you, you roll that many ones, ones, it's just, you know, it, it does happen. Rolling ones after ones, like, people say it doesn't happen that often, but it does. Um, it does, oh, I, no, I, yeah, yeah, it definitely does happen. But um, for these, like, shorter one-day things, I think the rule is once you have a... An, you can't die until you have one battle scar, and then if you have a battle scar and you die, you die. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, narrative is certainly really fun. Have you found any extremely cool combos in your time actually like playing them, Dave? Um, I, I think the funny interaction you get is it's really easy to have double balanced, um, which isn't a rule much anywhere else. But uh, there's lots of ways to get rerolls, um, and often you'll have um, somebody whose weapon is already balanced or uh, ceaseless, and then they'll also get, um, you know, an ability that gives them balanced within their six inches or, you know, depending on the, the thing. Um, and that just becomes silly because uh, I, I don't even know that, like, it almost seems like that should be a general, like a, like a FAQ wide rule is that an operative should never have more than one, unless they have relentless, you shouldn't ever be able to, re I guess you can use CP, right? To roll more than one. You can also do ceaseless and balance, which you know functions yeah. kind of similarly. I think Pathfinder specifically can get a marker light and actual balanced. So you yeah. end up so, but, with uh, two rerolls. But what you wind up with is you have these monsters running around where like half your team can all basically hits every die they roll because they all have, you know, um so I don't have any like particular um uh, combos that I've, that I've discovered um, other than that, just like you, and, and, and often the, the biggest enemy I found is not how strong your operatives give, get, but you forgetting how many upgrades they have. Um, and I've tried like in, in, in the app, like you can click on anybody and see what their, you know, what all their honors do. And I tried different things. Like, I don't know if you guys have found anything, like I will put little colored poker chips down, you know, like I put it, when someone has a grenade, I put a little grenade icon you know, or a token down next to them to remind me that they have a grenade. And then I'll also do one for each, like, you know, whatever, plus plus triangle movement and plus whatever, you know. And, and, and But once you have somebody who has two or three different upgrades, you wind up with just more poker chips on the table than operatives. And it, it becomes very hard to remember what everybody, you know, you're, you're already, Kill Team's already a complicated game where you're remembering what everybody does naturally. And then you have you know all these extra talents that they've gotten yeah and some of them can feel a little unfair some <laughs> of the equipment like if you play against worm blade sometimes you you can end up giving operatives like fly so the mining laser just like flies around and disappear <laughs> just like very obnoxious you can get like uh, like a four up invuln on some characters i believe which just feels very obnoxious <laughs> The Phobos Exogeist Scrambler, if anyone hasn't run into that, it lets you omni-scramble anyone on the map. You don't need visibility, and it counts as having one extra infiltrator. Gnarly. The other some thing... The, some of the narrative things just get wacky. Well, there's stuff that I think almost no one has ever seen. And, and like, in going through the app... Through coding the app, and um, going through every single book, um, I, you know, I, I've looked at literally all of them and had to figure out some way to support them with custom code. There's only a few I just bailed out on. Warp, uh, Warp Coven and Void Dancer Troop but have wacky spec ops that I was just like, you're just going to have to track this yourself. I'm not going to automate this. But there's a there's a great one that the Crute have, the uh, First Docker Kin Band, where they have a requisition. When one of your operatives dies, gets a flame, you know, it rolls that double one, they can eat him. And everyone, you pick somebody on your team who ate that dead operative of yours, um, and they get, I don't remember the, they get some sort of upgrade. You get their memories. Like you get their memories. They get their memories. But right. you can also do it, not if they're slain, but if they roll a one, which is the critical impairment um, one, which I think normally reduces your movement. And then there's like a, a, a custom rule where if they've eaten his leg off, then... Um, you, you can't recover that wound unless you roll a six instead of recover. Normally you recover a wound on a five plus and there's a six plus. So it's like this funky custom rule that's like super flavorful, where, like, so to speak, where the crew have like eaten their dead, but also eaten this guy who's just so badly wounded they thought left him for dead, but then he recovered and now he has like a limp. And I just, I think that's hilarious and, and kind of a charming, um, you know, way to, way to put the story in, into the rule set. Yeah. 
narrative rules writers definitely have had a field day i think one of the cooler ones for crew is you can get like a workbench because they're all like weaponsmiths so you can take all your normal weapons and just give them tons of upgrades for no reason mm-hmm. which you normally wouldn't be able to get similar to how i think for legionary one of their assets is just oh you just get three rare equipment for funsies the warp coven every part of that team has something weird and custom about it that uh is really well done but uh they it's like they designed that team to make it difficult for someone making an app to uh to support yeah everything about warp coven is complicated so warp coven is the team that you have had the most trouble with on the app how about higher tech circle are they are they much easier by comparison then there there's well and they keep changing it so it's up to date now as of the balance patch um they were complicated um but not yeah warp coven was the the hardest because you have the like i will validate your team like when you go to start a game and pick your team i want to make sure that it doesn't let you pick you can uncheck this box but by default it will make sure that you're picking a valid team Mm -hmm. um and they have all those rules for you know, if you take this many Rubik Marines, then you can take this many Zangors, and you can only get a second gunner if you've taken six Rubrics. And 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 um, in narrative, they can get uh, psychic disciplines and boons, and they can get an extra one that that is more than they get in matched. But it ha- can't it has to be unique. I think I don't remember off the top of my head, but you have to, you have to roll for it, or you have to roll, and on like a one or a two, you you get a random one, and on a three plus you have to you can pick it and so the, like all that supported the app so when you click the button it will either roll or let you pick depending on you know zeech's decision um Hyrotech, um they had something because they're i think isn't maybe the despotech or the apprentech can get a sec a, a, a cryptic action or something in narrative i don't remember what the, the thing is the assistant can get one action yeah yeah so that's in there um and i have a little icon that that lets you pick that and then they also there's a couple cool ones like um um hunter clade when they die or when you when they die or when you remove from for them from a roster there's an option called recycle instead of deleting them where you let you 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 get some of their pieces back and it gives you i don't remember what it, it, it it's it gives you some some you you take however many experience points they get and you can redistribute those to the other operatives in your team, the idea that you're recycling them. So I have like a little button in there for, you know, when you go to delete it, there's also a button to recycle them and it costs you the RP and then you can... It's actually um, cost zero RP. I'm looking at it. Oh, on, maybe, it might be zero. Yeah, yeah. It's actually free. You just recycle. So they're just... Uh, yeah, you just recycle. We're all about recycling. So I, so I changed the delete. Like normally there's a trash can button or a picture and I made it a recycle, you know, icon. And, um, That's great. So like wherever, so I, I tried really hard that like wherever the option, if the option should be there, it should be there in the app. Um, uh, like the oath of moment for the space Marines where you pick like a quest for them to do and then you can't repeat it if they fail it. And um, there's, there's some neat flavorful things. Um, it's just like, I feel like a lot of people weren't doing them because it's so much work to run a campaign. So my hope is that by having a tool um that manages a lot of this for you that you can just kind of go play without having to do as much work but that said what i think is missing as we were saying is um the actual campaign where you could just run a campaign just playing one-off games you know not have a story and just level your guys up but i wish there were more you know packs that had you know a little mission of here's here's six missions that you can play in a row with your friends and they tell a story of some sort um yeah and 40k is full of cool like narrative arcs that make like a one month campaign, two month campaign. Like I've run, yeah, I think like four of them at this point. We've done mm-hmm. a Space Hulk phasing into real space, players investigating a Space Hulk, and then they found like an Eversur assassin laboratory from the dark age of technology. So like popped up and it was like a perfect monster who also had its brain intact. So it was sane, which was not acceptable. So the Inquisition wanted to kill it and Chaos was trying to steal it. We then had that. Um, that Space Hulk crashed into a planet, which started like a planet-wide war, and that was another narrative campaign we ran for like six months. Then we had a prison planet escape with three different factions all vying to either steal prisoners, uh, find lost technology in the Inquisitor book, and then like escape. And then our most recent campaign was a hive city where players insert it, like orbitally insert it into the top layer and climb down. But this was like a hive city from an existing planet 
where the space hulk could crash where a gene sealer cult invasion had at 1.1 1. 1, and then a chaos storm had come and nurgle was all over so as like they went down through the hive city there was like progressively more nurgle stuff when they started with gene sealer cults every so, single layer would, of that i love that's amazing it's like a gold mine of story gene yeah. stealer cult are such an a great one because you can just you can do a story i was thinking about this one at one point that you could have a story where like the cult has risen and the tyranids are on the way you know and you could have a it, you know it, you, you'd want to have it, it's hard to write because you want to you want to know when you're writing a campaign that um you want you want to tailor to the teams that you know your friends are going to be playing but you could have a great one where there's like a worm blade that's invading and then a hive a hive or a hive fleet come in and and honestly we eat everyone we writing um narrative cam i've been writing narrative campaigns with another friend of mine for the entire like the length of this cam like the length of this edition and one of the biggest things we've had an issue with is arcing stories so my advice honestly is to not let the story arc all that much as mm. as far as the writing kind of like a long-term campaign because it will drive you insane <laughs> because you're gonna have to like figure out how different pieces all fit together how to like include all the players so i'd probably like start with an overarching idea like space hulk could crash on a planet and then mm -hmm. kind of have like story beats that you want to hit and kind of let players play because the arching story maybe isn't the most important but giving them like a narrative beat for every mission where it's like you are at the top of the hive there's a lot of gene sealer cults so at the end of every turn uh someone can take a shot at one of your models so it's like a las gun shoots at you from the dark basically it'll represent that there's like hidden operatives and then in the next one, there's like egg sacs and then they burst out into ripper swarms. And you just set the stage that way rather than trying to like have the narrative kind of crawl out based on the teams because it'll drive you, it'll drive you insane as a writer. The other um, part that I think people should take a look at is maybe even without doing EXP for your team is just look at the spec ops, the, the, the operations. And each team has two and then there's 10 main ones in the book. Um, because those missions, basically all of them uh, will say like infiltration or breakout or recover archaeotech. And if you use your imagination a little bit, you know, the idea is they're, they're guiding you toward whatever your main objective is. And basically they all say, almost all of them are win five games if you scored points from one of these three tech ops and they'll give you a list of three. Um, and then once you've done that, then it'll say win a game where you score points from this particular tack up. And the idea is, you know, you're you're trying to exfiltrate a hostage or or, or whatever. Um, and and it just gives you a very soft way to kind of guide your play, where you're focusing on a particular tack up and imagining that that tack up actually relates to the story that you're um, that you're trying to tell. Yeah, yeah. There's and each team has has their own. They do. Everyone has two. And it's the good thing about the spec ops is you don't actually need to win games. You're just aiming to complete games where you score those um, tech ops. So it gives you something to do outside of purely winning, which I think is the, the key part about spec ops for narrative play. Because otherwise it does end up just being like a match play with more stakes because your characters get better and some of them can die, which is a little rough for some players. Have you found it to be an impediment that narrative is all based around core book tech ops and not critical ops uh our group locally we already wrote a small like google doc that uh transfers things kind of one-to-one -one between the two yeah. decks so for us i don't think it really has mattered all that much because everyone has gotten accustomed to the transfer over because our the new york scene runs a tournament every every month so we've been using the old cards with the new stuff so it hasn't really been an issue but i could see it being an issue it was something I was hesitant about because um, the spec ops all say you need to score this particular tack op and some of them map directly, you know, I mean, some of them are unchanged, right? I, I believe and Seek then, and Destroy is probably one of the harder ones because there's a lot of yeah. words around executing targets and like, yeah. there's, I think there's like three that all sound kind of similar. So we just have a Google Doc where if you want to use the old cards, these are the new cards for them. Yeah, and so I haven't implemented that in the app and I've thought about it um but i don't want to like assert you know i mean it, it, who cares what the real rules are you know I, I i think it's okay to be fluid on that and like i went ahead and went to the 24 victory points instead of the 20 like before they announced that was what it was going to be you know because i think it's like you want to do what people are doing and not what um 
not be a, a slave to the rules, but um, that one I haven't implemented um, yet in the app where, you know, it, it, it won't, it won't automatically give you credit for scoring a critical op unless it maps one to one. You can always just increment it yourself. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I might do that at some point. I was kind of hoping one day, like in, in one of those FAQs, they would just, you know, because every once in a while they will put a little. I can give you like they, our, our groups um, like one to one just so that you have something yeah. that's kind of standardized locally. And then if you want to have it as an option on the app, I don't think anyone would really mind. No, and it could just be a checkbox, right? That you use yeah. the user don't. Um, it just, Honestly, it's kind of funny that they like, I, Honestly, it's, it's for unclear your, to me. Uh, your upcoming campaign, Dave, you have, you have the app. You can put a little, like, put a little, like, banner. You know, some first time someone opens it, it's like, hey, we're starting a narrative campaign. If you wanted to do a thing, you can do it with us. I think that would be really yeah, cool. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a good idea. I, I had supported when, um, thank you, um, for, for Kilty Mulpin. Ben had his own special EXP curve that he was using for that. And I just made that an option in the app so that like you could start it using accelerated ranks and it would do that for you so that you didn't have to like manually gain their, their uh, leveling up as it, as it went along. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause I'm in charge. So I can, I can make it be, you can I don't have any, anyone to report to. Um, but really the goal is just that I want people to, if, if there's anything to this whole concept of the crusade spec ops mode, I want to, you know, I, I think that if it wasn't catching on, my theory was it wasn't catching on because it's, it was, people thought it was too much work to, to maintain all of that paperwork. Um, and so the, the question that I'm kind of asking with this whole app, other than giving myself, you know, a little hobby project to work on was if you make the tool available and make it easy enough for people to do does that enhance your play experience? And the answer might honestly be no. It might be this game didn't really need any rules and it's much more fun to just play one-off games with my friends. But at least it's there so that when you're running a campaign, um, it's it definitely, I mean, I've, I found it to be very useful. Like it, it for KTO, especially playing all those games in that short amount of time, like it was, I, I found to be, you know, essential to have something or really, you know, nice to have something that just did it for you. Yeah, I think for Kill Team Open, because we did the accelerator rules, I just gave everybody a piece of paper that had kind of like uh, the table. So it's like there was a little brain icon with a little reminder. It's like, oh, you you can't get experience this round or your leg falls off or whatever. And I just had that <laughs> as a table and let people like write on it. So just having literally anything visual, physical to remind was better than having people try to juggle an extra layer of rules on top, which was just not tenable. Cause I've watched it and I've tried it. So that was my, that was my takeaway when we were running stuff for the kill team open narratives. Cause we had two separate one day narratives and both of them had fully like different rules, but the narrative parts were everybody got a sheet and it was really obvious what the battle impairments were. And there was room to write your battle honor. So at least you could physically see it at all times. The Go other ahead. question would be, um, ways to to help you in game you know like you write it down you know I, I it might just be that it's hard to do in a short term and if you're playing it like like you were saying every other week was not often enough maybe if you're playing every week you just learn oh yeah this guy walks slower or faster or this guy uh doesn't ever get obscured or whatever and you just have to remember that but i find even with uh, without special rules just remembering oh yeah this guy has an aura that does this um sometimes you can be your own enemy and just not knowing your team well enough yeah, knowing your team is definitely a big part of getting better at kill team. So it's good to know that even narrative is teaching you that skill. <laughs> and I think that's getting us close to the uh, the end of the time. Is there anything you have like a narrative campaign that you want to shout out? I mean, there's the one that's coming up. Hopefully it shows up on the teammate app to try to get people involved digitally. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, so I think what I'm going to do um, is is I'll, put, I'll advertise it when it comes and I'll probably have something like a, a, a Google form or something that you can People can report results so that uh, we we can kind of have the see you know which side is winning as it goes along, and that'll that'll determine like who's attacker and defender in the subsequent games. Um, so look out for that. I uh, I don't know when, but it'll probably be probably be later in the uh, mid to late spring. Sweet, cool. Yeah, we'll keep an eye out for it. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we'll include uh, we'll mention the teammate dot software. Link in the podcast description. Um, also, you can just type it in. It's pretty easy. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on today. Thanks. I, I gotta go. I gotta go start learning Phobos again. I haven't played them in a while. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to a tournament this weekend, and I need to remember what they all do.
Yeah, they're a fun team. I played them last a year ago at Nova Open and did and did okay. Um, and had had put them down for a while in favor of Star Striders, but I'm excited about getting back to getting back to my Dark Angels. Nice. Well, hopefully we'll see you at the top tables. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, Phobos, Phobos are doing better. The the buffs helped. So, uh, yeah, you can join the rest of the Phobos brethren. <laughs> Sneak your way to victory. Thanks again for coming, Dave. And thanks again yeah, thank you guys. for listening. This was fun. Yes. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening and making it to the end of the podcast. Uh, today, we're going to introduce a little something. Um, due to all the listeners that we've had, thank you all, by the way, um, we've introduced a Patreon and a Discord. You want to talk a little bit about that, Travis? Yeah, we're going to have a Discord where we can chat with uh, anyone who wants to come in. Our goal is to help build up everyone's local communities. We have lots of experience between me and Jason. So the Discord will be the place where you can get a hold of us more easily. And the Patreon is a way to just help support us. I know it's not much and we're not asking for much, but any support goes a long way. Yes. So definitely consider that. Um, you'll find the links in the episode description. And once again, thank you for listening. Bye.